Trina Anglin, I'm the chief of the Adolescent Health Branch at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, and that one of my very proud responsibilities is that of school health. This afternoon, um, this very special workshop is being given um, by MCHB's um, grantee, um, and you're going to hear about the wonderful progress that they're making. The title of our workshop is Advancing Child and Adolescent Health and Education Outcomes Through the Delivery of Primary Care and Behavioral Health in Schools. I, um, after I give a little bit of an introduction, our first speaker is Dr. Sharon Hoover, who is a, a clinical psychologist and the co-director of the Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And the Center for School Mental Health is this, what we call the sub-recipient, or basically the sub-awardee um, of our grantee for our program that we'll be telling you about in a minute. Um, Dr. Haley Love, our second speaker, is the Director of Evaluation and Research at the School-Based Health Alliance, and the School-Based Health Alliance actually is the awardee of our, of our, um, of our program, which is called Collaborative um, Improvement and Innovation Center um, on School-Based Health Services. So let me tell you really quickly what the aims of our workshop are. You know, first is to increase your familiarity with two types of school-based health services. One are school-based health centers, and the other are comprehensive school mental health systems. So I'd like a show of hands for people who are really familiar with school-based health centers. Okay, so that's, I'd say about two-thirds of the people in the room. And what about comprehensive school mental health systems? So relatively few, okay. So, so that um, when Sharon and Haley are speaking, that they're going to describe the characteristics of each model of program, and then also give you some information about the effects that they have, all of the good things that have been demonstrated empirically um, to show that they're effective in assisting students. And secondly, and this is probably where they're going to be spending most of their time, is to learn about our national initiative that is driving improvements in the delivery of quality care, strengthening the operational standards that each program at a school um, needs to attend to to be able to do well, and to actually to increase the numbers of schools that either have a school-based health center or a comprehensive school mental health system. And at the bottom of this slide that you can see, you know, the abbreviations there, just to help you. Okay, so let me tell you to set the background um, about the history that the Maternal and Child Health Bureau has with school-based health care. I would say that we are the federal pioneer in the field. Starting in 1995, um, is that ever since we have consistently supported um, technical assistance and resource center programs, each with a project um, period of four to five years, that are all about strengthening school mental health systems. If you remember, in the sort of the later 1990s, there's a whole set of very adverse events occurring at schools, you know, kind of the initial wave of shootings within schools, and that our program for school mental health had already started. MCHB had actually had been um, sort of a partner with another bureau within the Health Resources and Services Administration, the Bureau of Primary Health Care, and together that they had provided a lot of support for school-based health centers, you know, starting the year before. And MCHB then realized that they, that, you know, the Bureau of Primary Health Care had a tremendous amount of, of money that they were able to invest. And MCHB was looking for, a, for for something that they could uniquely be responsible for and, and decided that school mental health was something that was really, really important that nobody else was doing. So that we were already kind of on the ground you know, and, and starting to be able to be helpful when all of these adverse events started to happen. Then, um, then, um, then 
back in 2000 is that MCHB then reinitiated really specific support for school-based health centers. So it wasn't providing the financial assistance to individual school-based health centers that was occurring out of, out of the Bureau of Primary Health Care, but it was really programming to provide technical assistance and resource center support so that each school-based health center in our country either could get going or could become stronger in some way. Um, and then in 2014, um, that the programs were merged um, to, to, um, to form the COIN on school-based health um, services. So remember that the COIN stands for, let me ask how many people in the room are familiar with the concept of a COIN? Okay, probably almost everybody is because that's been, has become MCHB's signature model program for developing improvements and innovations in a lot of different programs. Okay, so let me flip now. What I'm going to do, because I serve as the federal project officer, so the language on this slide is actually came from the original um, guidance, or at that time it was called the funding opportunity announcement. These days they're called notice of funding opportunities. But this is what the guidance has said for the goals for this program, which is wrapping up um, in about six or seven months from now. Um, and then when Sharon and Haley speak, that they're going to let you know how, as grantees, that they translated that into action. So their language is going to be much more fun than the official language that, as you are familiar with, would occur on, on a NOFO. Okay, so the first is improving the quality of school-based health centers and comprehensive school mental health systems. And so that the very first job that they were responsible for was developing and then implementing standardized, consensus-driven, by the field, um, performance measures for school-based health services. And so that we have one great set for school-based health centers, another great set for comprehensive school mental health systems. And then secondly, after that, initial work was done was to develop a coin and that each of you will each of them will tell you about their coins so that was sort of a coin around the quality of services and then separately but all of this kind of in you know in practice really is part of the same animal is to expand and improve the sustainability of each of these models of school based health services through the spread of innovative and practical it's not practical, it won't work, policy and financial approaches so that eventually that we can increase the numbers of school-based health centers and comprehensive school mental systems and that the guidance said 30% in four years, that was a very audacious goal, um, but we are kind of moving towards that. And then, and then also to have a coin that would be able to address those specific elements. But that was kind of done in a little bit different way you know, by each of our programs. Um, so I wanted to say you know, that this is what the Maternal and Child Health Bureau has done. However, if you look at on the website, you know, TVIS, you know, the Title V Information Systems, and if you go under the um, state action um, plans, you know, for your five-year needs assessments, that you're, and if you scroll through every single state under the population domain of adolescent health, that you will see that a fairly large handful of states are thinking or are, are supporting school-based health centers or mental health. And that's not counting the larger number of states that are concerned about adolescent suicide, largely through the performance, the national performance measure of bullying prevention. Um, and so that there's a lot of opportunities here, you know, for states to be able to work with our, um, with our initiative. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. Can I take a moment to pull my slides up? Yeah, no, please. That'll help me transition here. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I forgot to remind everybody that this session is being videotaped. And I th think that the videotaping is largely going to be our faces rather than the audience. Um, but at the end, when you're asking questions, that will probably repeat them so they can be picked up by the microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Anglin. So Trina has been a friend to our center for a long time as our project officer. And 
I think was very accurate in identifying MCHB as a pioneer in school mental health and school health. But I do also want to acknowledge Trina as a pioneer in the field of school health and mental health. We feel very fortunate, having had a number of project officers across a number of different efforts, to have had the pleasure of partnering with Trina on this, not only because of her passion for the work, uh, but also because of her deep knowledge of the work. I know uh, some of you may know Dr. Anglin was awarded with a prestigious award in, in our field in school mental health this past year, the Juanita, Juanita Cunningham Evans Award for Pioneers in School Mental Health. And so I just want to acknowledge that it's not just MCHB, but some of its champions who have really driven this work forward. So thank you, and we're delighted to be here today. In the 15 or 20 minutes that I have, I'm going to try to accomplish uh, quite a bit. So bear with me, and we're going to try to leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you have questions, we'll try to reserve them until until after Haley is finished speaking about school-based health centers, okay? So again, I want to send my greetings from our team at the Center for School Mental Health. We're based at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. I'm privileged to work with a fabulous team and co-direct the center with Dr. Nancy Lever. And uh, the, the center was founded, I'm trying to work our, there we go. The center was founded back in 1995 by Dr. Mark Weist, who has since moved on. Uh, he's down in South Carolina now, but remains an active part of our advisor group. And our mission is stated here, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that from the beginning, we've always emphasized a shared agenda between families, schools, and communities to carry out the mission of supporting student mental health. We don't feel that students' mental health should really rest on the shoulders of any one of those entities, but rather that it should be a shared partnership in the work. So as I said, I'm hoping to accomplish quite a bit in the 15 minutes we have together. So I will define comprehensive school mental health systems. Not as many of you raised your hands uh, in terms of being familiar with them, but my guess is after I've finished defining how we conceptualize, it'll be something that's quite familiar to you. I'll touch on what we think of as kind of some of the current successes and challenges in the field of school mental health, and then I'll talk with you about what Trina introduced, the idea of the development of national performance standards, as well as our COIN process, which has been a lot of fun for the past uh, four years, and we hope to continue doing this work of continuous quality improvement. And I'll share a few resources along the way, including our SHAPE system, which stands for School Health Assessment and Performance Evaluation System. So first of all, what is comprehensive school mental health? I'll start with what we think it is not. Uh, so we don't think of it as just kind of a mental health provider coming in and setting up shop or putting up their shingle in the schools, though we know this is often what school mental health can look like in terms of community-partnered school mental health. We really do see school mental health as being more of a partnership, a partnered effort between health and community health organizations in the community and, uh, and schools with the work always guided by the youth and families that we are partnering and serving. When we think of community partnerships, we really do try to emphasize that the community partners build on and not replace those school supports and programs and services that are already uh, a part of the school system. We try to rely on the natural supports within schools, but then really try to leverage the resources of the community. Uh, sometimes there's a misconception that school mental health is about students, for example, who are at the top end of the public health triangle or who are in special education services, for example. We really think about student mental health or school mental health as focusing on all students, both general education, special education, across the full continuum of supports. So we have, we have a triangle in just about every presentation that we do. We've had spinning triangles and upside down triangles, but essentially we really do conceptualize school mental health as supporting universal mental health of students and uh, supporting those who might have mental health challenges and may need more intensive services or the top of the triangle. One of our colleagues in Canada, we actually have a partner center in Canada, the Center for School Mental Health, and, and a group called School Mental Health Assist, which is really an implementation organization for school mental health in Ontario. And they came up with this diagram really to emphasize schools as being one part of the community or system of care. Uh, and this may look different in terms of how uh, the degree to which universal is provided, for example, by school employed or district employed team members versus community employed. 
but this is often the model that we do see where school employed or district employed uh, staff provide more of the mental health promotion and targeted prevention, and if and when there is a community provider supporting mental health in schools, they're often targeting more of the top tier. Again, this looks different uh, across many districts, and so uh, many districts work together to figure out how to best leverage their resources, but this is one model. So, we're often asked, why should we be supporting mental health in schools? Why should we grow school mental health, for example? Why develop a coin and develop national performance standards? So we think about this in some respects kind of in terms of both or, or across the continuum of the triangle. So first we think about that universal level, and I want you all for a moment just to think if you could pick one quality or skill that all young people would possess by the time they graduate from high school, what would it be? Just think. So how many of you thought calculus? <laughs> Maybe some did. <laughs> we might have a math professor in the audience. <laughs> no. And there may be some of you who thought kind of the, the standards, right, the reading, writing, arithmetic, and we know those are all critical, uh, critical to success. But my guess is that the vast majority of you thought of something that fell more in line with these social-emotional learning skills. How many of you thought something that kind of mapped onto this triangle somewhere, right? So I think naturally many of us do feel that part of the mission of schools or part of what we hope to see in the development of our young people and that schools may have a, an important role in is the development of social emotional competence or mental health promotion skills. And so that's kind of what we think of often as that bottom part of the triangle for school mental health. But we also know schools can play a vital role in addressing mental illness when we think about uh, kind of the pathway of mental illness, we do know that the median age of onset is quite young with most mental illnesses starting uh, somewhere in the mid-teens to mid-20s, right? So about half by the mid-teens, about three quarters by the mid-20s. We also do know that later onset, of later onset of mental health conditions are mostly secondary conditions and severe disorders are often preceded by less severe disorders most of which are left untreated. So we know this is a critical age. Again, I think I'm singing uh, or preaching to the choir rather. But we also know that many students uh, do receive services in the school setting. So if we think about it in the school context, for example, in a given classroom of about 25 students, about one in five will experience a mental health problem that causes mild impairment, about one in 10, a problem that causes more severe impairment, but less than half of those will actually get services that could help support their mental health needs. And what we find is that about three quarters of students who do receive services actually receive services in the school. We know there are many advantages of receiving mental health supports in the school setting. I'm not going to go over all of them, but it's not just about access. It's not just because it's where the kids are. There are also a lot of advantages in terms of productivity, less time lost from work and school, uh, greater generalization of behaviors, re reductions of stigma, and so forth. We also have quite a body of research at this point that's actually demonstrating the positive impact of providing mental health supports in schools, both in terms of psychosocial outcomes, also in terms of academic outcomes. We just recently put out a paper really looking at across the board uh, of school mental health interventions, kind of what were some of the academic impacts because for a long time, the literature really focused more on the psychological or psychosocial outcomes. We're being pressed more to look at if we're providing services in schools, do they make a difference in terms of academic indicators? There's good, good evidence to suggest that yes, they do. So shifting over to kind of what's happening on the front lines of school mental health, we think there's been a lot that's been going well, so kind of the successes or the good things that have been happening in the field. We have seen increased emphasis on things like multi-tiered systems of support, so not just kind of services at the bottom or the top level. We know not a lot of schools and districts are not resourced to do it all well. But we do see increased emphasis on evidence-based practice, on outcomes, on using data, on meaningful partnerships with families. We've seen an increase in uh, mental health training for educators and training for mental health professionals to work in schools. And as I mentioned, in terms of data, we've certainly seen an increased emphasis on outcomes and, and an expectation that if you're going to be providing mental health services, you need to be demonstrating outcomes. 
We see pockets of funding uh, in terms of supporting school mental health. We always think there could be more, but there have been certainly since you know the, the shootings that Trina mentioned early on, but certainly we saw a huge increase in federal investment after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School with efforts like Project Aware, Safe Schools, Healthy Students. We also see tremendously creative funding at local and even state levels to support school mental health. But we know that a number of challenges remain. Our funding is limited uh, and really quite variable when we look across schools and districts. We see struggles with integrating education and mental health systems, whether it's data systems or financing systems. Practice selection remains really challenging, so schools are not always the best consumers, so to speak, of mental health services and supports. We sometimes see lots of providers going in to try to do billing in schools, but there's not a real seamless kind of continuum of care that's provided. Uh, we see gaps in training, so even though we've seen an increase in workforce development to kind of provide educators, for example, with mental health competencies, when you look at the curriculum of educators, we're lucky to see three hours of training on mental health or even child development is lacking in terms of educators' uh, training. And in terms of the mental health workforce, we often see them providing what we think about as cow therapy, so it's often kind of crisis of the week work, uh, not always um, using theoretically or evidence-based work, theoretically driven or evidence-based work in the work they do in schools. Poor implementation support, so when we do see uh, clinicians, for example, trained in evidence-based practice, they often have very limited implementation support. There's often limited control and accountability of providers. And so one of the things that uh, our field has felt, I would say, for the long time is a need for standards, processes, and strategies for integrating mental health and education. And that's really kind of uh, what I think beautifully paved the way for the National Quality Initiative that Trina started to introduce. Again, it's a partnership between our organization and the School-Based Health Alliance. And so the beginning part of our effort was really focused on developing national performance standards. We've been looking at what does quality school mental health mean for a long time, uh, for a couple of decades. We've had you know, some NIMH funding, some IES funding, really looking at what is quality school mental health. But in terms of developing national performance standards, uh, we went through a relatively rigorous process for the first year or so of the, the COIN uh, support. This is what the phasing looked like of developing those performance standards. And then we started with our first co COIN cohort, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But I just want to show you what the elements or the domains of school mental health quality ended up being after this kind of empirical process of developing those standards. Each of these domains has indicators that go along with, with them, and I'll show you kind of where you can get a more full uh, uh, description of each of these. And then we also had domains or elements of sustainability, as you can see here. And then when we thought about kind of where, do, how do we get systems, schools or districts, to actually start making improvements in each of these domains, we determined that we needed to have something quite accessible for systems, and so we decided to develop a free online platform that schools and districts could go to to support their quality improvement processes, both in terms of the quality domains and sustainability domains. We developed the SHAPE system. Again, it's a free online platform. All of you can go to it today. You can click on the Join Now. Even if you just have a child in a school, you can go and get your blue star on the map, which just means that the school or district in which you live would then be engaged, and you can be engaged with the system itself. When it comes to an actual school going in and joining the SHAPE system or a district, they go in and join as a team. And what they can do is then really map out what are their service, what does their service array look like? Uh, who, what is their staffing, both school staffing and community staffing? And then they do a self-assessment as a team of their school mental health quality and their school mental health sustainability along all of the indicators, or the domains rather, and the, uh, the indicators umbrellaed within each of those. They then can go to a, a whole library of well-vetted resources so that they can engage in quality improvement. They get stars for doing so. And so this was the way that we really launched our COIN, was to have them enter the data into this system in the hopes that others in the field would join in. 
right? So this, for those of you who are familiar with Field of Dreams, uh, if you build it, right, we built the shape system and thought they would all come. But they didn't necessarily. We didn't have the 100,000 schools across the country signing up, but we did have many. We had a lot of what we would think of maybe as our early adopters. But we kind of, uh, I think, you know, had hoped that maybe everyone would stop doing the same old thing and have an epiphany and think, oh, I better start moving towards improved quality. But we know what it's like to be in schools and in districts and in systems that are slow to change. So MCHB really charged us with doing this coin effort to try to leverage the power of early adopters to kind of get practices out into the field. This gives you a bit of an understanding of kind of uh, what the use of shape is at this point. We have all the districts. Anyone from the Dakotas here? Because we are seeking you out. The blue, the blue states are the ones where we actually have shape engagement. So every state that's filled in there. So it's just the Dakotas at this point that have not engaged. Now this could mean that we only have one district from that state engaged, but there's some engagement. The yellow stars, are all, and in this case, the blue and red stars are all of the coin cohorts. So we have 25 districts that worked for 15 months very actively at doing PDSA's rapid quality improvement with us in the domains. And then more recently, we have developed a state coalition for the advancement of school mental health, where we had states apply with us. These are the states, in fact, the ones in bold have just recently been awarded as part of the coalition. So we've been looking to all different strategies uh, to have schools and districts engage with us around quality improvement, one of which was the COIN process, which as you know, since most of you are familiar with COINs, it's really breaking their process down into smaller steps. I only have a couple of minutes, so I'm gonna go very quickly, but do wanna highlight at least one of our COIN sites. This is Methuen Public Schools, one of their primary areas of focus was universal mental health screening, which is something a lot of schools and districts want to do but really grapple with. What I can tell you is they started out, this is kind of truly reflective of the COIN process, with administering the PHQ 9 to 1 student. They now have universal mental health screening district-wide. Uh, this just gives you some sense of the different tools that they're administering. I'm happy to go back into this later on. But they also use their data in a really compelling way to show their district that these mental health screening scores mapped well onto academic indicators like grades and attendance, which was, again, quite compelling. They also showed tremendous improvement over the COIN in many of the other domains that they measured. These are just the executive summary pages from SHAPE. We, we know that schools and districts who are not early adopters uh, may still be rejecting the idea of change uh, because they're too busy doing some of the things that they're already doing, the work is demanding and so forth. So we continue to work toward engaging other schools and districts and we see uh, rapid adoption. I, rapid may be a strong, a strong term, but we have seen tremendous growth in the last two years of the number of schools and districts who are engaging with us. We recently put on a trauma-responsive schools assessment because that's something a lot of schools are really trying to um, better address is their trauma responsivity. We've seen a large uptick in schools who have engaged with SHAPE as a result of this. Many schools ask us from a technical assistance uh, standpoint, how can we uh, do screening and assessment in schools? So we created a screening and assessment library that they can use on SHAPE, but they have to go in and do the quality performance standards. So there's been an uptick because of that. Again, we've been doing the National Coalition for the Advancement of School Mental Health, where we have uh, states coming together. I won't go into all the different strategies that the states propose, but essentially they had to share with us in order to be a part of the coalition what were they going to do, what levers were they going to use in their own state to get adoption of these national performance standards. And then one of the products of the COINS has been uh, launching a series of playbooks, learning from the COIN uh, groups that are at the COIN districts that we've been working with uh, for the past few years. So the first one that was launched looks like this. It was a school mental health screening playbook. You can find all of this on the SHAPE system. And essentially, we just go into some of the learnings from the sites that have been doing this work. We, all, we convene our COIN sites as well as others who are interested at our annual conference on school mental health. We move around the country. This year we'll be in Nevada. And uh, we would invite you to join us there. So we'll have questions at the end, but I'd like to turn it over to Haley now. Let's see if I can get this up for you. I think you're here. 
All right, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Trina. Um, I have a similarly ambitious um, objective for, for, for my 15 minutes here to talk to you about school-based health centers. So um, I'm Haley Love. I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation with the School-Based Health Alliance, and just uh, happy to have the opportunity to present um, a little bit about school-based health centers to you guys today. So I'm gonna describe and define school-based health centers, talk about our performance measure selection and consensus process. You'll see thematic similarity in Sharon's presentation and mine. Talk a little bit about our coin and early lessons learned. Explain um, the national scale-up of the National Quality Initiative. Uh, and describe how you can get involved, and we'll have some time at the end for questions. So even though many of you said you knew what school-based health centers were, um, I thought we would start with a couple of basics. So these are the six questions that people ask us about school-based health centers. What are they, where are they, who uses them, who operates them, who works in them, and who pays for them? So what are school-based health centers? They're like doctor's offices inside of schools. They represent partnerships between education um, entities, school districts, schools, and health entities, federally qualified <laughs> health centers, hospitals. Um, and they see schools as a common sense place to provide access to children and adolescents, particularly those children and adolescents who um, live in underserved communities and experience access barriers to healthcare. And we think pretty amazing things can happen when these partnerships are formed. And so does the Centers for Disease Control. They recently published um, in last year, a systematic review of school-based health centers. They surveyed the literature for 20 years looking at um, school-based health centers and their associated outcomes. And they found that the presence and use of SBHCs were associated with improved health and student achievement outcomes. So when we talk about health outcomes, the literature shows improvements in vaccinations, asthma morbidity, contraceptive use, birth weight, prenatal care, alcohol consumption, illegal substance use, and other topics when school-based health centers are present. We also see improvements in grade point average, grade promotion, suspension rates, seat time, and non-completion rates. So where are these school-based health centers doing such amazing work? A little bit of context, the School-Based Health Alliance um, completes the National School-Based Healthcare Census every three years. It's a survey where we ask every single school-based health center across the country to tell us about their location, their staffing model, their services provided, populations served, and funding sources. So, our most recent um, full data set is from the 2013-14 school year. The data I'll be sharing just now is from that data set. But we just completed the 2016-17 census. We had 83% participation, um, identifying about 3,000 school-based health centers and school health services programs across the country. So that data is coming soon. But back to the location of school-based health centers. Similarly to what Sharon said, School-based uh, North Dakota, the Dakotas are missing, but otherwise we, there is a school-based health center in every state across the country. Who uses these health centers? The majority of school-based health centers serve populations beyond the students in the school. Those may be the family members of students, they may be the siblings, like the siblings or parents, they may be out of school youth, um, some are serving faculty and school um, personnel, and others are serving other people in the community. Who operates them? Um, it's largely now federally qualified health centers that um, are the lead sponsoring organizations of school-based health centers. It's also hospitals, school systems, nonprofit organizations, local health departments, and others. And we see a, tr a, a dramatic trend. If you look at the gold line on this slide in the number of FQHCs who are sponsoring school-based health centers dating back to 2000 to now um, 
and what we will likely see in the coming census is of about 50% of health centers sponsored by federally qualified health centers. So who works in school-based health centers? What's unique about school-based health centers is that in more than, in nearly 70% of them, there's a primary care provider, like a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, or a physician working alongside a behavioral health provider because the challenges and needs of the um, young people and the communities that they serve expand beyond primary care. Um, it's often the sort of challenging context where these uh, young people live that, that create the demand for uh, mental and behavioral health as well. So these are the types of providers in school-based health centers. They all have a primary care provider, but you also see clinical support and behavioral health. And increasingly, we see school-based health centers providing oral health on site. Um, several of them have nutritions and dietitians or um, health educators. And slowly, um, we're seeing school-based health centers start to provide vision services on site. So who pays for health centers? The funding for school-based health centers are, um, is diverse. Many of them receive funding from their state governments, some from federal government, private foundations, schools and school districts, city and county government, hospitals, and others that you can see here. But what I think is important to acknowledge and understand is that they braid together various funding streams in order to sustain these health centers. The revenue from billing Medicaid or CHIP or private insurance doesn't cover the operating costs of the school-based health centers. Sustainability is often a challenge, so, it's, um, so health centers are working to pull together the funds to sustain them. Um, this slide is often interesting to people to see, though there are about um, 18 states that where the state provides funding to school-based health centers, many of them using their Title V dollars. Those are also the states where you see more school-based health centers than other <coughs> states. Um, states like Michigan, Delaware, um, <clears throat> sorry, Michigan and Connecticut having some of the um, highest levels of support. And we've also, we'll be releasing new data um, this summer related to, to the funding, and we see these numbers increasing in, in several of these states. So, the transition from the census and what we collected to, in the census to what this National Quality Initiative has made possible for the school-based healthcare field is to start to tell a more descriptive story, to with data about the services that school-based health centers are providing. This initiative is challenging the SBHC field to adopt the first ever set of standardized performance measures. So what does this make possible? We really believe that if we can align priorities and if school-based health centers can voluntarily document and report data, we'll be able to tell this more descriptive, more compelling story about the role that health centers, school-based health centers are playing in improving outcomes. We think that if data can start driving improvement in health centers, if they can compare how they're performing against other health centers in their state and nationally, they're gonna start um, identifying ways to improve the care in their health centers because ultimately we want to see 100% um, of SBHCs voluntar voluntarily adopting and reporting these performance measures. Um, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau set out the ambitious target of 50% of school-based health centers adopting and reporting these measures, and, and we nearly passed out. But then we thought, wait, what about those other 50% who say, that's not for me because the others are doing it. So we changed our tune and said, no, we, we're, we're looking, we want to see 100% of SBHCs adopting and reporting these performance measures. And Sharon can attest that we won't sleep until we, uh, we reach this goal. So what we needed then was a set of performance measures. So we brought together a group um, of people representing different stakeholder groups, school-based health center um, providers and administrators, educators, payers, students, 
board members of our organization and brought everyone to the table who was interested to participate in the consensus building process, knowing that if we didn't come up with this together, if we didn't come to consensus together, we would have no chance in reaching towards these national objectives. So we started with a list of diverse measures and they reflected thematic areas that school-based health centers in states across the country were already asking school-based health centers to report data on. The challenge was is that uh, the devil with all of this work is in the detail, and every state um, was defining each of their measurements measures differently. So we asked them to look at this list, to look at specific definitions that aligned with national child quality measurement initiative definitions, like the HEDIS measures or the CHIPRA measures, and pick what they thought were the most important, sensitive, feasible, and usable measures. We came up with five, um, and five was what we had hoped for because we felt like it was realistic. So these include the annual well child visit, annual risk assessment, BMI screening and nutritional and physical activity counseling, depression screening and chlamydia screening. We're really pleased with these measures because they cover child and adolescent health. They reflect sort of a spectrum of prevention. They include a couple of measures focused on adolescents um, and the majority of school-based health centers serve adolescents. We also picked two what we call test measures. And they're measures that don't necessarily align with national definitions, but are helping us to describe sort of the uniqueness or value add of school-based health centers to um, health and education systems. So how do we help increase the amount of time that students are in their chairs um, and learning? And how do we collect data from the clients themselves about their experience in the health center to derive um, improvements in the health centers. So we feel like now for the first time we have this opportunity to compare apples to apples. So our next step was to bring together some really smart, motivated people to come together around a shared priority and work together to identify um, promising strategies for adopting and reporting these measures. And so that was our coin. We um, have led a coin over the past four years. School-based health centers in Connecticut, Colorado, North Carolina, and Seattle have been our pioneers working on the adoption of these five performance measures, and we've learned a lot. Um, we've learned a lot in seeing leadership emerge in, in states and how teams are forming and they are inclusive of providers, administrators, educators, and where that leadership is emerging and is inclusive of these diverse perspectives, um, we're starting to see changes. We're starting to see improvements. We're seeing opportunities for sharing. Um, I think everyone, because they know what a coin is, has heard the steal shamelessly and share seamlessly and steal shamelessly terminology. I mean, I think that's the essence of what they're doing um, is getting together and sharing lessons learned over the challenges that they're experiencing. And we're seeing them use data to drive improvement. Many of them may have felt previously that they had reported data to their state. They never saw it again. They didn't know what they used it for. It just was this accountability mechanism. It's changed the way they think not all of them, we've got a ways to go, but it's changed away. They're thinking about data. Data isn't punitive, data is used for improvement. We have some challenges um, that we are ta tackling as well. It hasn't been easy for school-based health centers to adapt their electronic health records um, to be able to document and then extract this data. Um, they are faced with every the challenges that all health center providers are with lots of demands on their time and really focusing around these specific areas and, and priority setting um, around the same goals it takes time and investment. But having the coin to drive them and work collaboratively has been amazing. So now we're working towards national scale up. For the 2016-17 school year, um, school-based health centers across the country were given the opportunity to report the performance measures. And nearly 600 school-based health care programs across the country in 34 states reported on one or more of the measures. 
They're now, um, in the next week, going to be able to go in and download a report to view a, their school-based health center and how it compares to others in their state and nationally. So this is a sample report from a health center in Louisiana where they can look at each of their measures and see how that compares both to their state average and their national average. They can view the data in a table as well to see how they're comparing and really start to think about this data and how they can um, identify other programs in their, in their states and nationally who are working on um, similar issues and use the lessons learned um, to, from our COIN to, to drive this improvement. So we are encouraging and inviting school-based healthcare programs across the country to join us in this work. Um, our slogan is Quality Counts. Starting now, school-based health centers will be able to report this performance measurement data annually and download reports to see their data. We've created a website that has um, resources for school-based health centers to be able to draw on the lessons learned from our learning, our COIN. Um, they can review definitions, learn promising strategies, view tips on how to set up their electronic health records and learn what data is being collected and how privacy is protected, among other things. So um, we're gonna open up to questions. We just shared lots of content, but we want to um, provide the opportunity now uh, for all of you guys to ask questions about, about this work. So I'm gonna join Sharon over here. That if it will still repeat it. Yes. Um, so, thank you so much uh, um, for a wonderful presentation on the conference of Mount Hall School and School Based Health Centers. Uh, I'm from the state of Delaware, where I chose to participate, and I'll, and I'll be there for our uh, presentation. We've just completed uh, the entire analysis of impact evaluation of school based health centers uh, looking at Medicaid claims. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna repeat the question really quickly um, and, and then hopefully provide you some answers. So, um, I didn't catch your name. Uh, I'm Khalid Hussaini, I'm a senior scientist who uh, takes out. Okay, Khalid, thank you. Um, so Khalid is asking, with so many different people entering data in different electronic health records and entering it in different ways. Extraction is both a challenge, but then also what the data is saying is, a is not necessarily describing the comprehensiveness of what the work that's being done, and therefore it's not telling the story yet that you want it to. Um, I think, well, what we say over and over in, in this work is that it's a marathon and not a sprint. I think that's the best starting point to, to, to answer your question. And um, that this takes time, but you, but, but you will get there. I think that 
maybe the QI effort that you need to focus on is bringing the providers together to talk, to, to talk about documentation, um, talk about how they can, and we, would, we can connect you with our colleagues in North Carolina who are in the COIN and experience exactly the same challenge. Our data is all over the place. Um, we don't know what screening tools to use. So they work together to determine that they would use the same screening tool, they would document it in the same way, um, and that gets the providers all working on the same page. You still have the electronic health record question, which is the other um, challenging issue, that, that there are different electronic health records, entering data is different in each one. Um, I would have to say I'm less of an expert in this space, but, but the, the way our health centers participating in our COIN and our across our field have begun to begun to resolve this challenge is creating discrete fields in their um, in their electronic health records where they're reporting this information and, and just trying to simplify it down. That can require resources um, in order to get those changes made and that can be a challenge. Um, I would say um, stay the course, focus small, Think about individual like PDSAs that you can do. Bring to if if the on, if if the only thing that you, that you can accomplish is is come is a universal screening tool and getting them to document it in the same way, um, and creating the fields in the electronic health record that are capturing that. You've accomplished so much. Um, I'd love to continue the conversation afterward as well. And if if I may just draw the parallel in the work that we're doing in school mental health. We, we have run into uh, countless situations where our schools and community partners who are engaged in the COIN process or outside of the COIN process but just trying to engage with SHAPE said, but we have no idea how many students we've screened for, so we have screenings for depression and other psychosocial issues. We have how many students have you, have you served at each tier of intervention? And then we're asking schools to doc, or school teams and district teams to document how many students have shown improvements at each tier in academic outcomes and, and psychosocial outcomes. And most of our systems come back and say, I have absolutely no idea how many we've served at each tier or how many we've improved at each tier. So they're taking very, and, and we, I have to say, we contemplated for many times, do we remove these? Because we feel like our, we're, we're pushing it too much by asking these systems to document this. But we were consistently reminded by our improvement advisors that we want to be aiming for where we would like to see the field going. And so they are making small improvements, whether it's that they're now documenting just their depression screeners, or they're documenting just students who are receiving tier three services from community providers, and they hadn't done that before, or they're documenting kind of how many students actually receive services once referred. So I would, I would agree uh, with, with Haley's sentiments. Other questions? So the question was, what is the difference in mental health services received in school-based health centers and comprehensive school mental health systems? So one way of thinking about it is that we have approximately, what, 3,000 schools with school-based health centers. And in theory, any school of the 100,000 or so schools across the country could have comprehensive school mental health systems. So we feel like we had a harder task than the school-based health alliance in terms of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm joking there, but we, we have to develop a census and performance standards, we being the school mental health side of the COIN process, in theory for all schools who could have a continuum of mental health supports in schools, which is any school really. Now, mental health services that are provided in schools without a school-based health center could look quite similar. So many schools in the absence of a school-based health center have memoranda of understanding, for example, with a community mental health, community behavioral health partner who comes in, who has an agreement with uh, space in the school. They might provide um, tertiary services like individual, group, family counseling for students with identified mental health challenges. And that might be what it looks like also 
in a school-based health center. It all, I mean, in one school-based health center is one school-based health center, right? So in some school-based health centers, I've worked in a school-based health center where I was able to provide both, both mental health promotion and more kind of treatment-like services, whereas in some school-based health centers, the mental health provider really does more of the treatment. So it's, it varies, but it can look quite similar in a school-based health center school and a non-SBHC school. Yeah, like another way to think about it might be, and, and we don't, we probably don't have you know, really excellent data here, but the professional background of the people who actually are providing the services, and so that in a school that doesn't really have a comprehensive school mental health um, um, program, um, that probably, you know, kind of the most likely person to be doing that is a school counselor. Okay, and in contrast, you know, within a school-based health center, that that person doing that type of service is most likely to come from a social worker background. You know, and we have a you know, little sense of whether a school counselor or a school social worker you know, is more effective, because it really depends on whether they're using evidence-based practices. But there, there are you know, different professional disciplines. Yeah. And in many schools where there's not a school-based health center, you will have mental health professionals, really multi-disciplines as well. So we have a lot of partnerships that we see in schools that don't have a school-based health center, but they do have, you know, they do have partnerships with psychologists, social workers, uh, licensed professional counselors, and so forth. I think the value, having again worked both in a school, a school with a school-based health center and one without, the value of having a school-based health center partnering with the mental health services is tremendous because you have kind of the, the comprehensive health care partnering with mental health. So, other questions? Yeah, so we'll start back here. Yep, you. Mm -hmm. Ah. Sure. Everyone wants to go to Las Vegas, right? <laughs> it's uh, the Advancing School Mental Health Conference. And if you, I'm happy to put it back up, but if you Google Center for School Mental Health or Advancing School Mental Health Conference, I will say the request for proposals uh, just closed last week. Uh, we have had a couple of people request extensions, so if you're really um, wanting to go, but for example, could only go if you're presenting work, let me know and we could uh, consider extensions. We've had a tremendous response so far, so it looks like it's about to pop up. It doesn't look like we actually have the website here for the center. Uh, it's on the next slide, I think, but if you Google that, you'll find it. And usually every state is represented. It's about 1,200 attendees usually. Several other countries come as well. Yes. They will. So we will be adding all of the presentations on the AMSHIP site. Sorry about that. For the data that's coming out, you said next week, um, on the, um, what are you using for the, the national data piece? So that's any school-based health center who reported the measure. Sorry, let me repeat the question. So um, she was asking what data that, we, that is coming out, the reports that I showed that will be um, available in the next week um, is included, and where is the national data coming from, or what does it represent? So every school-based health center was invited to report those five performance measures for the 2016-17 school year. So we saw variability in the number of school-based health centers reporting on the different measures. So the majority, about probably nearly 500, reported on the number of clients with a well-child visit during the previous school year, but only 200 reported on the number of students screened for chlamydia. Um, so when you see the national average for chlamydia, the number will be much lower than, than the national average for well-child visit. It reflects the number of school-based health centers nationally who reported that measure. Up here. Yeah, great question. So um, the question is, 
is it possible to explain the change in sponsorship of school-based health centers, why we see a number, an increasing number of federally qualified health centers sponsoring school-based health centers compared to earlier reasons? Reimbursement, I mean, I think that's the primary reason is reimbursement. I'll hand it to Trina in a second and she can speak some more. Historically, local health departments were the, were the leading um, sponsor of school-based health centers and it was really a funding question. Um, they couldn't be reimbursed in the same way. Um, and now federally qualified health centers get an enhanced reimbursement rate for the service provided in school-based health centers and they have a much more sustainable model than any of the other models. We see hospitals, um, more and more hospitals sadly moving away, but federally qualified health centers moving in increasingly as sponsors. Um, yeah, like through the years is that the Bureau of Primary Health Care, which all of you know, know sponsored the Community Health Center Program, um, have changed their policy so they actually are more quote, friendly, than they used to be for school-based health centers. There's actually was sort of a sea change quite a while ago. Um, and that if you think about it, is that school-based health centers actually are satellites of the community health centers, okay? But there was a real boost, you know, as part of the Affordable Care Act, is that remember that school-based health centers within the context of the Affordable Care Act received a total of, was it $50 million per year over the space of four years. So there was a total, I think, of $200 million funding that was called the Capital Improvement Program that could be used for bricks and mortar um, as well as like, um, you know, kind of improvements, um, like an, an equipment for school-based health centers that could not be used for personnel. And then just today, yeah. um, that um, there's an announcement out, you know, by the same group within the Bureau um, of Primary Health Care, um, offering, um, is it a $10 million? $10 million. Yeah. Um, and that they are hoping to be able to fund at up to $100,000 a piece, 100 school-based health centers, you know, again, as part of a capital improvement program. Mm -hmm. so, so that's really exciting, so that we expect there to be another boost, yeah. um, very specifically because of the, you know, of this very generous funding. Mm -hmm. So it is, I think, past our time. It's 3.32, so we do oh, need... To, we, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, for anyone who may be interested in the School-Based Health Alliance Conference, in addition to a trip to Las Vegas, you can join us in <laughs> Indianapolis um, this summer, June, in, in mid-June. Um, you can visit our website, www.sbh4all.org, to learn more. And thank you, everyone, thank for you joining so much, the session. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate it.